Take our hands, O oh God, as we come to worship. Increase our faith and commitment as you lead us into the future. It's a beautiful morning, and it's good to see all of you here this morning and to welcome those who are visiting with us today. We're happy that you're here, and on behalf of the congregation, we invite you, obviously, to come back again, and hopefully the service will be meaningful to you. We also invite you to participate in any of the programs that the chapel sponsors. The announcements, uh, by and large, are in your bulletins this morning. Let me call your special attention to several items. The uh, Friends of the Clearwater Beach Library and Rec Center will be having one of their uh, uh, shell sales this morning in the uh, Friendship Foyer after the worship service. So if you're interested in uh, perhaps some gifts or some decorations for your own home, this would be the time to check that out. Uh, the ICCC conference. The information is in your bulletin. Several individuals from the chapel have indicated an interest in going, a probability of going, and uh, if you would like to join them, it's going to be in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey this summer in July. Uh, I have the information. I've got the reservation forms. Uh, the church will pay the registration fees for anybody who, uh, who goes from the chapel by the sea. Uh, there's a notice in there about we need some office angels as we approach uh, vacation time. Uh, we need people to man the phones in the office during the day, during the regular hours when uh, Connie and Sherry are on vacation. So if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, check with Sherry and she'll be glad to help you out. Uh, this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock at the Missouri Avenue Baptist Church, there will be a memorial service for Dolores Estes. Dolores and Keith were members of the chapel for many, many years, and uh, she taught Sunday school among uh, many other um, volunteer uh, opportunities she took advantage of at the chapel. And uh, so you, if you, you knew Dolores and wish to be at that service again, 11 o'clock Saturday morning at Missouri Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, as you know, the uh, Jacobson Foundation, there's quite a, a larger article on it in your bulletins this morning. Uh, they want to give us matching funds for a number of uh, very um, necessary uh, programs, that uh, projects for the, uh, for the facility the chapel facility as well as some of our program opportunities. Uh, they're making a, a, a pledge of $200,000 and uh, hopefully as much of that as possible can be matched. It's a pleasure to be able to tell you that at this point uh, we have received over $50,000 in pledges and actual gifts from the congregation in addition to that $200,000. So if you haven't given something yet and want to give something, uh, I also put it, when we had the renovation back in uh, 99, we did two things. We asked people to make a contribution towards the total cost if they so desired, or if those who were able and interested wanted to, uh, we broke down what the, uh, the different costs were for the different aspects of the renovation. So I've done that for you this morning too. So please, just read that over, uh, see what might be of interest to you, and uh, thank you in advance for your generosity. I will tell you, if you think the second candle is not lighted, it is. We must be running low on oil, didn't check it, we should have done that, but uh, they are both lighted, so uh, symbolically the Spirit is here in full force this morning. <laughs> Let's now begin our service of worship.
please join me in the invitation to celebration responsively. We have been blessed with the gift of another new day. It is a gift containing unimaginable options and opportunities. We have also been given the talents and skills to use this day productively. So how should we respond to the challenges which face us? We will begin with worship. Here are here. Call upon God, reading the invocation in unison. God of the ages, you who are the source of creation and love and being, you who are before and beyond time, be present in our midst as we worship with prayer and praise, indeed with our entire beings. Show us that what happens here is pointless unless we take the lessons we learn into the world and apply them in the living of our lives. Grant us the vision and strength to first see and then create a better tomorrow for all the earth's inhabitants. Give us the courage to fight what is wrong and support 
for the many gifts we have received and in commitment to the work of our church, let us be generous in our morning offering.
We tend, O oh God, to look on the dark side of life. And there is so much going on in our world to produce the kind of fear and anxiety that tends to pull and hold us down. With the hating and hurting that is seen all over our planet, it is no wonder that we have difficulty finding hope and reaching a positive anticipation for what the future might bring. Give us the strength and wisdom to change such outlooks and attitudes. Enable us to look around us and also see the incomparable beauty in and of this world which you have created. Let us not forget that for every act of unkindness and cruelty, there are so many more in which people treat each other the way they themselves want to be treated. And even as we have been the recipients of goodness and compassion, support us in our efforts to repay such blessings by doing good for our fellow beings. As we walk through our dark valleys, let us never lose sight of the heights to which we are aspiring, heights of light and life. This is our prayer, ending as we come to you quietly and serenely in personal meditation. Amen.
Let me read to you this morning from uh, two parts of the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm reading first from the book of Genesis, the first book in our Bible, and then from the book of Joshua. First Genesis 11, verses 31 through chapter 12, verses 5a. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. And when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go with your, con your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in, all, and in you all the family of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then I'm going to read, didn't read quite, going to read then you, to, to you from Joshua. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving to you, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all that the law that my servant Moses commanded you, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's think about those words this morning as we continue together in our worship.
Lorraine and I are very fortunate. When people retire, they often have to determine where they are going to live. Perhaps without an income coming in, they feel they can no longer afford their current home. Or maybe they live in an inhospitable climate, which was fine when they were younger, but is no longer attractive or feasible. And then there are health considerations. Are they ready to go into a facility where they can eventually move, if necessary, to assisted living and or nursing care if they start out with a living, uh, with a living uh, independent living option? What about the question of family? Where do they live? As we get older, we may want to be closer to our children and grandchildren or other relatives for a variety of reasons. I said that Lorraine and I are lucky. We are where we want to be and anticipate that as we soon reach full retirement, we will be able to stay there. So these are all considerations which must be considered as retirement approaches. But there are also various considerations when anyone moves anywhere. For the younger set, whether or not they are moving because of a change in jobs, they must think about the cost and availability of housing, the educational options for their children, the kind of quality of professional services provided, the recreation and cultural possibilities, and the list goes on. Well, being personally in the retirement boat and also knowing what the Blevins family is anticipating, let me offer some observations and suggestions on this subject. You can move to Phoenix, Arizona, where you are willing to park three blocks away from your house because you found shade. You can drive for four hours in one direction and never leave town. You have over 100 recipes for Mexican food. You know that dry heat is comparable to what hits you in the face when you open your oven door at 500 degrees. The four seasons are tolerable, hot, really hot, and are you kidding me? <laughs> you can move to California, where you pull in over $450,000 a year and still can't afford to buy a house. The fastest part of your commute to anywhere is going down your driveway. You know how to eat an artichoke. When someone asks you how far something is, you tell them how long it will take to get them there rather than how many miles away it is. The four seasons are fire, flood, mud, and drought. <laughs> you can move to New York City, where you say the city and expect everyone to know that you mean Manhattan. You can get into a four-hour argument about how to get from Columbus Circle to Battery Park, but you can't find South Dakota on a map. You think Central Park is nature. You believe that being able to swear at people in their own language makes you multilingual. <laughs> You've worn out a car horn if you have a car. You think eye contact is an act of aggression. You can move to Wisconsin, where you only have three spices, salt, pepper, and ketchup. <laughs> Halloween costumes have to fit over a parka. Sexy lingerie is anything flannel with less than eight buttons. The four seasons are almost winter, winter, still winter, and road repair. <laughs> the highest level of criticism is he is different, she is different, or it was different. You can move to the deep south, where you can rent a movie and buy bait in the same store. Y'all is singular, and all y'all is plural. Everyone has two first names, Billy Bob, Jimmy Bob, Joe Bob, <laughs> Betty Jean, Mary Beth, etc. Everything is either in yonder, over yonder, or out yonder. You can say anything about anyone as long as you also say, bless his heart, at the end. <laughs> you can move to California where you carry your 3,000, I'm sorry, to Colorado, where you carry your $3,000 mountain bike on top of your $500 car. You tell your husband to pick up granola on his way home, and he stops at the daycare center. A pass does not involve a football or dating. The top of your head is bald, but you still have a ponytail. A joint is not a sleazy bar or a convenience store. You can move to the rural Midwest, where you've never met any celebrities, but the mayor knows your name. Your idea of a traffic jam is three cars waiting to pass a tractor. You have had to switch from heat to AC on the same day. You end sentences with a preposition like, where's my coat at? Soda is called pop, and seltzer is called soda. Or, and this is especially true of and for retirees, you can move to Florida, where you eat dinner at 3.15 in the afternoon. <laughs> All purchases include a coupon of some kind, even houses and cars. Everyone can recommend an excellent cardiologist, dermatologist, proctologist, podiatrist, or orth orthopedist. 
road construction never ends anywhere in the state, and cars in front of you often appear to be driven by headless people. <laughs> so there you have it. Every place where one can live has its attractions and distractions, its ups and its downs, its goods and its bads, its pluses and its minuses. That has been true since humanity first discovered caves and that some were better than others. It was certainly true of characters in the Bible, many of whom moved often in their lives for a variety of reasons. In that regard, I think this morning particularly of Abraham and Joshua. Abraham and his family moved from Ur, a Sumerian city which was located in modern-day Iraq, to Haran, which today is a site in Turkey, while traveling toward Canaan, where they eventually settled after a number of years had passed. Why did they move? We don't know. According to the Bible, the switch from Haran to Canaan was at the command of God. And then we find Joshua as the leader of the Israelites after the death of Moses, looking at Jericho and realizing that they would have to conquer the city if they were to gain access to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. This was after they had spent 40 years traveling through the wilderness following their escape from slavery in Egypt. In the case of both Abraham and Joshua, we are talking here about more than just the physical location of their dwelling places. We are talking about some other states in which they lived. I would suggest that Abraham was living in a state of anticipation and expectation brought about by the promises of God that he would somehow father a great nation and that Joshua was living in a state of freedom brought about by the release of his people from a state of slavery in which they had lived and existed for over 400 years. So the states in which they lived had an emotional and psychological aspect which in some ways was far more important than the physical space which they occupied. How about you? Where do you live? Where are you living right now? Do you live in a state of anxiety brought on by financial or emotional or professional or health or other worries and problems? Do you live in a state of contentment because at least for the time being everything is going well and you have no particular cares that are making life less comfortable than it can and should be? Do you live in a state of fear? worrying about what the future might hold and concerned about the violence and pain which appear to be overwhelming our planet? Do you live in a state of depression which is caused by feelings of insecurity and inadequacy as you compare your lot with that of others who you feel are doing so much better than you are? Do you live in a state of joy resulting from the good things that you are experiencing and a recognition that this world is a pretty beautiful place after all? Where do you live? Let me suggest that regardless of our current psychological situations, each of us is living in a state of grace. Grace is defined in a religious sense as the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Now that's kind of theologically scholarly. Let me explain it as an illustration to which I think we can all relate. It was one of the founders of Methodism, John Wesley, who once observed, when I go to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first wonder will be to see many people there whom I do not expect to see. The second wonder will be to miss many people whom I did expect to see. And the third and greatest wonder of all will be to see myself there. Now that's grace. To be given by God that which we don't deserve because He loves us. And we are all recipients of such grace. Therefore, no matter what our circumstances, we are all living in a state of grace undeserved and unmerited, but there nonetheless. And perhaps if we realize that, some of those other states in which we so often live, at least the less desirable ones, will not weigh us down quite as much. Where do you live? As a child of God, you should know where you live, in His arms and under His care, and it is good. One of the blessings that we all enjoy, that we're privileged to possess, is the blessing of God's presence in our lives, shown in a variety of different ways. And we are blessed that we have this community, this family, this church, in which we can come to God through the ceremony of communion. Our table belongs to Him, we are His guests, He is our host, and all are invited. No prerequisites, no preconditions, no pre-anything. We are all invited. 
On the night before his death, as uh, Jesus gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem with his friends and followers to celebrate the Passover, and as he passed around the bread and the wine, he gave them new and greater significance. He said that they were more than just bread and wine. They were symbolic of his body and blood, soon to be given as examples of what perfect love is all about. As he shared with them, so he shares with us. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this and each and every moment of our lives. Help us to live them to the fullest. Help us to come to you in each and every way that we possibly can. Bless us now as we join together in this ceremony of communion and bring us closer to you as you bring us closer to one another. Amen. The bread we break is a remembrance of the body of Christ broken for you and for me. As we eat of this bread, let us think about the love of God and all the different ways that it is shown to us. As we drink of this cup, let us think about the blood of Christ shed for you and for me and for all people.
As we drink of this cup, let us think about our love and how we can show it to others. Thank you, God, for today, for tomorrow, and for all the days to come. Thank you for the gifts you have given us to live those days to the fullest. Let us go forth from here with faith, courage, strength, as we realize your grace and seek to live you in the world. Amen. Even as we're standing on the promises of God, let us move on those promises and do something about creating a better world, the world that he created and wants us to do what we can with it. And in our efforts, may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.